MAS staff retrenched by the book. Prosecution confident of conviction in Jongnam murder trial. You're watching the evening edition of News on 2 with me, Renee Fong. The Human Resources Ministry said it is not required by law to explain the delay in taking up the cases of 3,600 retrenched Malaysia Airlines staff to the Industrial Court. Minister Dato Sri Richard Riot nonetheless said that the Ministry, through the Industrial Relations Department, has sent out letters to the affected workers explaining the situation. The letters he said had to date been sent to some 1,500 of the 3,600 laid off unionized MAS staff. Saat ini kita sudah menulis surat kepada uh, kepada 1,500 di antara yang 3,600 So with with full explanation. So itu sebenarnya saya itu sudah memadai untuk menjawab dan di bawah akta uh, menteri tidak. Speaking today, Datuk Sri Richard also noted that MES was no longer in existence and as the company had wound up replaced by Malaysia Airlines Berhad, therefore the ministry could not go after it. Last month, the National Union of Flight Attendants Malaysia questioned why it took the ministry two years to decide not to refer the cases of 3,600 retrenched MAS workers to the industrial court. The prosecution in the murder trial of Kim Jong-nam, the half-brother of North Korea's leader, was confident they would be able to get a conviction, but there remains a daunting task in achieving it. Speaking outside the Shah Alam court, Chief Prosecutor Muhammad Iskandar Ahmad acknowledged that his team was the underdog and faced an uphill battle, but insisted that they would be able to secure a conviction. The two women suspected of killing the half-brother of North Korea's leader returned to Shah Alam's High Court on today. Indonesian Siti Aisha and Duan Thi Huang from Vietnam pleaded not guilty as the start of the trial last week to charges of murder that carry a mandatory death sentence if they are convicted. To me, uh, as the prosecution team, we have an uphill battle in this case. We are the underdogs. Yeah. They, they have the upper hand, but uh, we wait and see. We have our own strategy, so let's wait. Jong Nam fell ill at the KL International Airport 2 on February 13th of this year and the women are accused of smearing the toxic VX nerve agent on his face at the behest of suspected North Korean agents. Defence lawyers have said the pair were duped into believing they were playing a harmless prank for a hidden camera TV show. Three individuals have been remanded at Kota Kinabalu Magistrate Court today to assist in the investigation of the embezzlement of 1.5 billion ringgit federal funds related to rural projects in Sabah. The three suspects included a party Warisan Sabah Youth Chief and two Amno Youth Chiefs. Magistrate Cindy McJews Balutus in allowing the application made by Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission, MACC, issued the five-day remand order on the three suspects, which begins today. The suspects were held by MACC yesterday to facilitate investigations into allegations of mishandling of 1.5 billion ringgit in federal funds meant for rural development in Sabah. The 1.5 billion ringgit is part of the federal government's 7.5 billion ringgit allocation through a ministry to develop rural areas in Sabah from the years 2009 to 2015. The Seri Manjong Magistrate Court today issued a new seven-day remand order on two Royal Malaysian Navy personnel to assist in the investigations into the death of two Navy men in the detention unit in Sungai Wangi last month. Both suspects, aged 27 and 39, are now being investigated under Section 302 of the Penal Code for murder, which upon conviction brings the death sentence.
Magistrate Ainul Bashira Dona and Don Biajid allowed a police application to further remand the suspects. Both suspects have been placed under remand beginning today until next Monday. Previously, the suspects were remanded on October 3rd to assist in investigations under Section 325 of the Penal Code for voluntarily causing grievous hurt in Section 506 of the same act for criminal intimidation. To date, police have detained seven individuals who had been assigned to the detention room during the incident to be investigated under Section 302 of the Penal Code. A contractor, M. Kajendran, pleaded not guilty at the Butterworth Magistrate Courts to charges of falsifying information and documents for the company's commission of Malaysia, SSM. The offence was committed this month in the SSM building in Sebrang Jaya, Pulau Pinang. The accused was charged under Section 364, Subsection 2 of the Company Act 1965, which carries a 10-year jail sentence or a maximum fine of 250,000 ringgit or both. Meanwhile, the accused son, Vinod Kumar, was also facing with the same charge and claimed trial. Both the accused pleaded not guilty in front of Judge Norhayati Muhammad Yunus. A SSM official led the prosecution while the accused was represented by attorney V. Siva Kumar. Both accused were then granted bail of 10,000 ringgit each. A second scandal involving Johor police has emerged with claims that two policemen from the Sagamat Petrol Unit was photographed flirting with a woman believed to be a prostitute while on duty in a police patrol car on Sunday. Johor Police Chief Datuk Muhammad Khalil Kader Muhammad said the policeman involved has been removed from the patrol unit with immediate effect pending an investigation. Dua daripada tugas FTB, roda kereta uh, peroda dan diletakkan dalam tugas uh, yang tidak ada hubung kait dengan masyarakat uh, dan tata, uh, kertas siasatan tata tertib telah dijalankan dan based on the finding, kita akan ambil tindakan susulan. This was the second case involving the Johor Police Force after seven of its policemen were caught on video having fun with an illegal gambling tauke at an entertainment centre in the city. Part of a wall and ceiling of a room collapsed on the floor of the top of a six-story hotel in Port Dixon, Negeri Sembilan. The incident occurred as a result of the impact caused by a damaged water heater on the ceiling, which subsequently exploded. In the 4.15 a.m. incident, three children were trapped for half an hour on the second floor before being rescued by the Port Dixon Fire and Rescue Team. State Fire and Rescue Department Director Nora Zamkamis confirmed the incident and informed that all three victims were trapped when the room's exit route was obstructed by the fallen debris from above. A team of officers as well as firefighters were forced to enter the room through the balcony using a ladder in order to rescue the victims. Meanwhile, senior fire officer of the Port Dixon Fire and Rescue, Abdul Rahim Atan, said that two of the victims, Ng Toi Tuan, age 51, and his wife, Chia King Kao, age 52, who were on the floor above, sustained injuries on their legs. The couple's daughter, Chia Shoheng, age 27, however, had no injuries as she was fortunately sleeping on the ground floor of the hotel during the incident. A grandfather and his grandson were feared drowned at Sungai Batang Sadong near Simunjan, Sarawak at around 6.30pm yesterday. The boat carrying the two capsized after hitting a wooded block in the middle of the river. Simunjan Fire and Rescue Operation Commander Mat Undek verified the incident whilst confirming that the search and rescue began at 9 a.m. today after receiving the report. The operation has been expanded to a 4 km square radius on the river surface of Lubo Pungor village. The operation involving a team of rescuers as well as policemen is still currently ongoing. In the incident yesterday, Kalawin Jeffrey, age 27, a witness, had attempted to save both victims but failed due to strong river currents. A pedestrian believed to be mentally unstable was killed when he was hit by a motorcycle at kilometer 21.5 Jalan Yong Ping Kluang at 6.30 a.m. The motorcyclist, however, only suffered a broken shoulder. 
Kluang District Police Chief ACP Muhammad Laham said Teh Gyok Chai 57 had suddenly stood in the middle of the road before the incident took place. The motorcyclist who was heading from Pekan Palo to Yong Peng hit into the victim as he had failed to avoid them. The case is being investigated under Section 41, Subsection 1 of the Road Transport Act 1987. Selangor Malaysian Maritime Enforcement Agency MMEA has detained three sand barges of trespassing into Malaysian waters without permits yesterday. District Maritime Director Captain Maritime Abu Zaki Muhammad said following a tip-off from the Central Region Maritime Department, the three sand barges were found around 0.4 nautical miles of the Lumut Straits between 2.15pm to 2.45pm. Upon further inspection, there were 18 crews on board, including 17 Chinese nationals and one Indonesian. The crew were aged between 29 and 58 years, made up of 17 men and one woman. The boat was escorted to Port Klang for further investigation. The case is being investigated under the Merchant Shipping Ordinance 1952 for anchoring without permission from the Director General of the Marine Department. Commencing November 1st, the Malaysia-Thailand border in Bukit Kayu Hitam will operate for 20 hours. This through the National Blue Ocean Strategy and Boss Cooperation between the Ministry of Domestic Trade, Cooperatives and Consumerism, KPD and KK, with the armed forces to control border areas and curb the activities of fraud and the smuggling of subsidized goods. According to KPD and KK Enforcement Unit Director Datuk Muhammad Roslan Mahayudin, the ministry will station 8 to 10 personnel at the border at any given time. Moving items such as petrol, diesel, cooking oil, sugar and flour as well as liquefied petroleum gas LPG will be closely monitored. Tapi kita berhati-hati juga untuk memastikan bahawa barangan-barangan yang kita kawal ni tidak uh, terlepas ke negara luar. Jadi saya sebutkan tadi barangan yang kita beri subsidi ini setiap kita jaga supaya tidak keluar daripada negara kita. Jadi kita nak pastikan ia dinikmati oleh rakyat kita. He was speaking to the media and a legislation and act briefing enforced by KPD and KK to officers and armed forces personnel at Camp Sultan Abdul Halim Muazzam Shah in Jitra, Kedah. The scope of the briefing covered current issues such as the leakage and malpractices of goods control at the border, intellectual property and consumer rights issues. From 2013 up till now, a total of 48 cases involving 150,000 ringgit was seized by authorities. Coming up next, more than 250,000 Prima units approved to date. Welcome back. A total of 259,882 units of One Malaysia People's Housing Prima units nationwide have been approved for construction as of September this year, of which 141,661 are in various stages of construction. Prima Corporation Malaysia CEO Dato Abdul Mutalib Alias said 8,475 Prima units had already been completed and 934 units handed over to the house owners. Dato Abdul Muttalib noted that 11,944 Prima units with a market value of 3 billion ringgit had been sold. Prima Corporation Malaysia had also received 166,972 applications from those who have registered with Prima to purchase Prima homes. To be eligible for Prima housing, an applicant must be a Malaysian with a household income of between 2,500 ringgit and 15,000 single or married age 21 years old and above, and does not possess more than one property. The affordable homes are priced at between 100,000 and 400,000 ringgit, which is 20% to 30% lower than the market value. Prima was launched on July 4, 2011 by Prime Minister Datuk Sri Najib Tun Razak. 
The Malaysian Association of Tour and Travel Agents, MATA, hopes the government would provide incentives and allocation needed to stimulate the tourism industry in the tabling of the 2018 budget. Its president, Datuk Tan Kok Ling, in a statement said, this include tax incentives for tour operators handling domestic travel packages to be extended to the year 2020. Datuk Tan said that this tax incentive will enable small and new tour operators, mostly Bumiputra companies, to grow. During the tabling of Budget 2016, the government also announced a tax relief beginning years of assessment 2016 to 2018. This is especially for tour operators, which handles tour packages to Malaysia and brings in not less than 1,500 domestic tourists per year. Mata also hopes the upcoming budget would allocate funds for capacity building in the tourism sector. Its target is to increase the level of professionalism through the Malaysian Certification of Excellence and Diploma as the industry-leading official certification standard. The General Cargo Port and Dry Bulk Dock at Dermaga Tanjung Lembong Langkawi, which was upgraded in August, will be able to accommodate the entrance for containers and vehicles for the long term. Deputy Finance Minister Dato Othman Aziz said the project under the Langkawi Development Authority LADA will help in boosting the island's economic development and also achieve its target of 5 million tourists by the year 2020. Daripada laporan yang kita terima, uh, Dermaga Tanjung Lembu ini telah pun uh, mengendalikan lebih daripada 275,000 uh, uh, metric tan. Kemudian dan juga dari segi penumpang pun meningkat dan mengikut uh, uh, fokus ataupun uh, jangkaan mereka uh, akan terus meningkat dari masa ke semasa sesuai dengan kemajuan dan pertumbuhan ekonomi Langkawi lah. Dr. Othman said this at a press conference held after launching the General Cargo Port and Dry Bulk Dock Upgrading Project Handover Ceremony at Dermaga Tanjung Lembong Langkawi. Among the upgraded work done is the construction of dry bulk docks, dolphin structures for large boat mooring and travel dock structure to raise yards. In an effort to provide skilled manpower and understanding of the industry's needs, Polytechnics will continue to implement joint ventures with companies, government departments and agencies and private companies across the country. Deputy Minister of Science, Technology and Innovation, Mosti, Dato Dr. Abu Bakar Muhammad Dia, said the collaboration will not only provide opportunities for students to carry out their industrial training, but also to provide exposure to lecturers in understanding the needs of an industry. Jadi saya tengok kerjasama dia melibatkan latihan pencara. Jadi ini juga penting kerana uh, pencara banyak dulu orang kata pencara ini hanya tahu teori. Tetapi bila ada attach benda-benda ini, mereka boleh keluar masuk industri, dapat import daripada industri, mereka mereka boleh uh, mengajar menggunakan apa kendak industri. Datuk Dr. Abu Bakar said this after witnessing Theo Polytechnic Merlimau Strategic Collaboration Certification Signing Ceremony together with 11 agencies. Its director, Rashida Mustafa, said the market ability of its students was proven when 89% of its students managed to secure a job during the first quarter of this year. Corporate companies have been urged to implement the productivity-linked wage system PLWS, which is expected to benefit both employee and employer. Human Resources Minister Datuk Sri Richard Riot said that to date, 80,000 companies have implemented the system since it was introduced in 1987, involving 3.7 million workers. PLWS will enable workers to enjoy a fixed salary and extra pay based on the productivity achieved by each employee. In addition, it will also allow workers to enjoy the profit distribution along with the employers aside from the annual salary increment based on productivity. If the company makes money, then that money should also go down to the employees. Thus, by doing so, the employees will feel that, well, all my effort is being recognized. And by being recognized means they are paid more. So that is the, that is the basic principle behind this uh, productivity-linked wages system. 
Dato Sri Richard was speaking after officiating the opening ceremony of the Conference of the ASEAN Salary and Productivity Conference in Kuala Lumpur. Amongst the companies that have implemented the system are Ajinomoto Berhad, Proton, Syme Darby and IFS Capital Malaysia Sundaran Berhad. That concludes this evening's News on 2. In our top story, prosecution confidence of conviction in Jongnam murder trial. Join us again at 12.30 tomorrow afternoon. I'm Renee Fong. Thanks for watching and have a pleasant evening.